Okay, let's get this straight. Girls play with dolls. Boys rip it up with action figures. You know, collecting miniature people has been around for decades. Our next collector has taken a unique angle on this widespread collectible. Sue, this really is a wonderful collection you have here. It appears that I'm looking at one of the greatest collections of antique dolls I've ever seen. But in actuality, I'm not looking at antique dolls, am I? That's correct, Doug. Some years ago, I got interested in uh, antique dolls and uh, decided that uh, I would like to make them and I attended some doll shows and met with some people who actually did reproduction dolls. And uh, so anyway, I got involved in uh, going to classes and became a certified doll artisan. And so these dolls that you see here around the house, most of them were made by me. Antique dolls, very rare ones and the very best ones, are many hundreds of thousands of dollars. If I make a doll that's a reproduction and I make it accurately reproduced, they will sell for maybe a fraction of that cost. So let's say a doll maybe would go for $1,200, I might sell it for $400 as a reproduction. I've mostly reproduced from the old German firms from like 1850 to 1900. That was the goal, what is called the golden age of doll making. That's when the French doll makers and the German doll makers made their most beautiful and most famous dolls. You know, dolls have a long history and they go back thousands and thousands of years. They made them out of cloth, they made them out of wood, they hand carved wooden dolls before they knew how to do the porcelain firing process. Then around 1900, the sociologists and the psychologists decided that dolls, which had previously looked like adult people, that then they should be more like a child so that a child could actually play with the doll and, and see it as themselves. The master mold is made from the antique doll so that it's exactly like the antique. Some of the more rare dolls, uh, they would not allow them to be used uh, to make a mold because of the likelihood that it might break, might crack, might chip, and that would forever damage that doll. So I'm sure there's dolls out there that haven't had molds made, and there's also dolls out there that haven't been found yet. They're in great-great-grandma's attic, and nobody's discovered them, and believe it or not, they do come out now and then, and all of a sudden we find a doll by a doll maker that's never been heard from before. It does take many hours. If you, say, would begin at the beginning of the week and you worked constantly eight hours a day, you would probably finish it by the end of the week. Is this really a collection, or, or what exactly am I looking at here? While I don't actually consider myself a collector, I guess what is a collection? A collection is if you have many items uh, of one thing, and I have many dolls. This is a great little display you have here. Are any of these original antiques? There are three uh, antique dolls on the table, and uh, I'm just wondering if there was any way you could tell the difference between a reproduction and an antique. Well, I was kind of looking, and uh, I don't know if I could actually tell the difference. Well, this collection that you see right here is from the Kessner uh, company in Germany. And this little girl right here is an antique. One of the ways, Doug, that you could tell the difference is if you look at the eyes in this doll and this doll, which are original antiques, when they set the eyes in, there will be a gap in there because the eye itself did not exactly fit the socket. So a lot of times if you look at that, another way to tell is look at the painting. It's a little bit softer. This little girl has a little bit higher color from today's painting, and these have much softer colorings. Sue, you were talking about the transition of doll making from the older ones where they looked like adults and the newer ones where they started looking like babies. This is the china head, uh, one of the earlier dolls made and uh, they were made to look like adults. I always think that this one kind of looks like our grandmothers might have looked with the type of clothing that she has on and the hairstyles that she has. And then in the mid-1850s, they decided that they should make dolls that looked more like children. And so this was, we think, one of the very first ones uh, that was made to look like a little girl doll, for instance, rather than the lady dolls. Sue, tell me, how's your husband feel about your collecting? Well, he's pretty tolerant, Doug, and uh, for the reason that he's also a collector. 
And one of the things that he collects and has over a long period of time are, are wrenches from, oh, probably 1835. You can see that he makes a real nice arrangement and he has fun uh, restoring them and maybe making new handles for them and straightening the jaws and doing what needs to be done to make them uh, look really nice again. I met your husband many years ago and uh, the first time I was down here this entire wall was filled with wrenches and I remember a wrench over here on this wall that was six foot long. Did he sell his collection then? He did sell his collection a little bit earlier and uh, the six foot wrench that you mentioned is the only one in the world that we have ever found or that anyone knows about. So this is where it all starts, this is where you make the head for the doll. That's right, Doug. Uh, I have some heads here to show you. Uh, this is a, a mold that I use, and uh, the molds come in two parts. First is the face, and then the back. They're banded together, and I band them together with real heavy rubber bands like this so that the slip doesn't come out when it's poured. And then they're fired in the kiln, and uh, then when they come out, they look something like this. They are white and they are porcelain. They are very hard. So then they need to be painted. This is it. This is kind of where the doll comes together and, and she's made beautiful. And um, it's done in about five firings, sometimes three if it's a smaller doll. But for a doll like this, I may do anywhere from five to seven paintings. And uh, as you can see, I use pictures of the original antiques to paint so that I can get them as close to the color and as close to look like the original antique as I can. So we paint a flesh color and that gets fired. That's the first firing. And then when that comes out, you usually do the eyelashes, the brows, and maybe a first coat on the lips goes back in for second firing. Then you still have the hair to deal with, and you have this, and then you have to do two or three more coats to get all of this to have the depth of color that you want. I love this room, all the different sewing machines and the spools of thread, all the color. I bet you spend a lot of time in here every day. I really do. Uh, I, this is kind of my life, Doug, and I really spend uh, probably as many as six to eight hours in here, several days a, a week, and sometimes every day if I have a lot of customer orders, particularly when I'm preparing for a show. And all of our costumes are complete with the underclothing that the doll would have worn. It takes a lot of time to get one outfit, and when you go to a show, you need maybe 50 or 60. So how long are you going to do this? Well, that's a, a fun question to me because a lot of my friends ask me when I'm going to quit doing this. Uh, and I always ask them why. Because I don't play golf. I don't play cards. Uh, I don't. We travel occasionally, but not all the time. Uh, and I just really, this is love of my life. I love seeing the creation. And when I get into a project, I can hardly wait to uh, see what it's going to look like when I'm finished. And so I will just keep working until I get it to where I want it. So it's just a fun thing. And I, I really don't have any plans to retire. Got a collection that you think is neat? Unique? Cool? Drop us a line, send us a few pictures at CollectingSeriously.com. You know, Sue's collection was really unusual. Yeah, very much. Most of the time when people collect things, they, uh, they spend all their time looking at garage sales and antique shops and searching online for that next really cool piece. But, but her collection, it was all about things that she made. It was all things of her own creation. You know, in Sue's case, our Bafua idea really didn't work very well. I mean, she didn't have the bulk. Uh, compared to most, her collection was really small, and, you know, she may have had her favorites, but really every item was unique. That's true. And for the most part, none of them were any more or less valuable than the next. And I sure didn't see an ace in the hole. You know, I love meeting people that have such a passion for their hobby, but I gotta admit, this was a really difficult interview for us. It really was, because her collection didn't have any antiques, which is what I relate to. Her hobby is all about the expertise that she's acquired in duplicating antiques. Well, she certainly is talented. And patient. So thanks for checking out Collecting Seriously.
where we get in touch with extreme collectors, maybe even you. Ooh, I like that. Or how about this one? Let your imagination get the best of you, or let your imagination run wild. I don't know, something like that. That's what we need is a catchphrase. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, you know, by the way, do you think they've noticed that we're not really playing this game? I don't even know how to play this game, do you? Yeah, well, I think so.